Hello Info person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the major discoveries from the last few months coming from our red neighbor, planet Mars. And this time some of these discoveries are actually super exciting and have not been expected at all. But as always, as in some of the previous videos from a few months back that you can find in the description, we're going to start this video with a rock. And mostly because Mars is filled with rocks and many of them are kind of bizarre. And well, this is one of these bizarre rocks that was imaged in the early 2025. This is coming from the Perseverance science team and it's a rock now nicknamed St. Paul's Bay. And as you can kind of see, it does seem to have somewhat bizarre and somewhat unexpected features. Specifically, it seems to contain these really strange spherules, a few millimeters in size, whose origin is currently unknown. And not all of them are entirely spherical either. Some of them seem to be elongated, some of them seem to possess angular edges, and some have been broken in the past. As a matter of fact, some of them seem to even have tiny holes. And right now the mystery is, of course, their formation. Now on Earth, if we find spherules, they can actually form in a lot of different ways, but microspherules are usually associated with some kind of a volcanic eruption, followed by rapid cooling, as tiny droplets from the volcanic eruption first melt and then condense into these spherical formations. And so here one potential explanation is maybe some kind of a powerful impact from, for example, an asteroid that potentially produced a lot of droplets that then formed this rock. But I guess one problem here is that they are kind of large and also not entirely spherical and so explaining all of them might be kind of challenging. Alternatively, they might be similar to the famous Martian blueberries discovered back in 2004 by the Opportunity rover, or bizarre spherules pictured by Curiosity inside the Yellowknife Bay. Or maybe all three are entirely different and potentially formed through processes we still don't understand. And so in essence, the formation mechanism in this case, if figured out, would have a huge implication for our understanding of the Martian processes and what Mars was possibly like back in the days. And this wasn't actually even the only rock that was recently in the news because a few weeks before this, one of the images from the Jezero crater taken by the Perseverance revealed another bizarre rock. And mostly bizarre because it just looked out of place. And that's actually the thing about a lot of rocks on Mars. They often seem to end up in a completely different place through processes we're still trying to understand. Now some of this could be the result of erosion and wind activity, but in many cases this can also be just the result of ancient water activity that we know existed on Mars. Anyway, because this was such an odd rock, the Perseverance team decided to investigate it by conducting a much more thorough analysis using what's known as LIBS, Laser Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy. Basically a tool that fires a laser at the mineral and then analyzes the light coming from the mineral which reveals elemental composition. And here the main composition seems to be the mineral called kaolinite, a relatively soft and white silicate clay mineral that seems to be just a little bit different from the one we find on Earth. On Earth, this mineral can only form in temperate, wet conditions. So basically conditions that we usually associate with conditions required for life. And right now, out of thousands of different minerals discovered on Mars, this one is actually super exciting. Now there were some other minerals of course, including spinal or a magnesium aluminium gemstone, but that one can actually form in igneous and metamorphic environments, so it's not as exciting. And because on Earth we usually find these minerals in locations with intense rainfall, or in many cases in hydrothermal environments, this by itself is kind of exciting. Exciting because it once again highlights that at least at some point, Mars, at least in some locations, had conditions not so different from modern Earth or at least had conditions somewhere where technically life could develop. And approximately one year ago, we actually discussed one of the previous discovered rocks that was super exciting because of these very bizarre leopard spots. The spots that a lot of scientists are now convinced were potentially created by some kind of a bacterial interaction. Mostly because if this was a natural reaction, it would actually require temperatures of 120 degrees Celsius or higher, which would not really make sense because of the location where this rock was found. And so a microbial reaction is a lot more likely. But this is of course just circumstantial evidence and it would be difficult to discover actual microbes unless we collect these rocks. However, just a few days ago from when I'm making this video, there was also a super exciting discovery of something we've never seen before. A discovery of the largest organic molecule coming from the red planet. Now some of the previous simple molecules have been discovered before, but this time the analysis from NASA revealed decaying, undecaying and dodecaying 
complex compounds containing 10, 11, and 12 carbons that at least on Earth are usually associated with fatty acids. Basically stuff we usually find in a lot of different cells. And since fatty acids usually form cell membranes, as well as have a lot of other functions, right now the discovery of fatty acids on Mars does not really have a very good explanation. Now technically it could be some kind of a geological process, and possibly a process involving hydrothermal vents in the past, but it's also a biosignature. And so here we have several discoveries that essentially point at a potential microbe activity. But obviously still no telltale sign that this is microbes and not some kind of a weird geochemistry. As a matter of fact, chemical reactions on Mars might be just a little bit different. For example, surprisingly, it was actually kind of difficult to determine exactly why Mars is orangey red. Now we know that it's because of iron and water interacting over time, but exactly what it formed was always kind of elusive. Or in other words, what kind of an iron oxide was formed as a result, and how and why was it formed? And for a while it was assumed that maybe it was some kind of a hematite, or something similar we find on Earth, but recent analysis and recent very thorough investigation revealed something entirely different. By using several missions including ESA's Trace Gas Orbiter, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and all of the rovers active on Mars, researchers almost definitively confirmed that the redness here comes from a mineral known as ferry hydrite, a water-rich iron that usually forms in relatively cold conditions and in environments with somewhat neutral pH that we now believe Mars potentially had for billions of years. Which means that when Mars became red, it was no longer warm or possibly never was warm to begin with. And this simulated Martian sample basically recreated the color very well. This is iron-rich ferry hydrate mixed with a bit of basalt to make it appear just like Mars. And because ferry hydrates here seem to represent most of the iron oxides on Mars, here this is a really important confirmation for what Mars must have experienced for a very long time when it seems to have lost its water and when it potentially finally changed its color. So at this point it was very likely somewhat cold and drying out pretty quick. Right now the research suggests this probably happened approximately 3 billion years ago. But up until that point, Mars potentially looked very different. Now we obviously have no idea what it looked like yet, but there's a lot of evidence that it did contain very large lakes and at least several seas and oceans. As a matter of fact, there's been a lot of visual evidence of what seems to be ancient waves and ancient ripples and even ancient currents that existed on Mars before, and this is of course very similar to what we observe on Earth. In this case this potentially existed 3.7 billion years ago, and based on the ripple size and based on the amount of current, researchers believe this body of water was probably not very deep, possibly 2 meters or 6 feet in depth, because the ripples here were pretty small. An average wave height was only 6 millimeters, with the average wavelength of 5 centimeters. But the biggest mystery has always been, so where's the water now? What exactly happened to it and why is Mars dry now? Well, based on some of the observations from MAVEN, for many years it was believed that it was probably the result of the solar activity and specifically the solar wind that over time stripped the atmosphere and then very likely stripped the water as well. In other words, here the belief was that because of the solar wind and the lack of the magnetosphere, Martian water just kind of flew away. First it evaporated and then the molecules probably became hydrogen and oxygen, with hydrogen flying away and oxygen maybe becoming that iron oxide. But the thing is there was a lot of water, and if a lot of water did that, Mars would potentially look entirely different, at least in certain locations. Yet that's not entirely the case, as Mars does seem to have somewhat similar composition on the surface, independent of the location. And so in one of the recent studies, scientists actually discovered something super unexpected, something underneath the surface. In this recent study, researchers discovered that there is a huge deposit of water inside the Martian mid-crust. This was actually done by observing a lot of different Mars quakes over time, mostly through the data from the InSight mission, and the seismic data from the InSight lander determined something unusual seems to exist 11.5 to 20 kilometers beneath the surface. Here inside the layer of relatively fractured rock, there seemed to be a lot of evidence for the presence of large amounts of water. And not just like a little bit of water, here the scientists think it's probably an entire ocean of water that seems to be hidden inside. Here there's enough water to create at least one large ocean on the surface of Mars. And yeah, there are some parallels here with the overall plot from the movie Total Recall. If you watch the movie, you might remember there is a huge deposit of water hiding inside Mars. So once again, science fiction predicted something that seems to be real. 
but because this water is so deep, it would be very difficult to access it or to even find out if it's really there through some kind of a geological mission. Here, because this is up to a depth of about 20 kilometers, it's definitely beyond our technical capabilities. Nevertheless, this is actually a really good explanation for what probably happened to all of the Martian water over time. Here, most of the water definitely did not escape from Mars, but basically became absorbed into it. With this recent study basically explaining that Martian regolith is actually just really good at absorbing and holding water inside. With the study simulating Martian regolith once again, and discovering that unlike regolith on Earth, Martian regolith is extremely good at maintaining water inside. And though this is not a definitive proof yet, if proven correct, this would actually solve the mystery of Martian water once and for all, and would potentially explain a lot of other mysteries such as the occasional presence of water vapor in the atmosphere, which then sometimes disappears and reappears afterwards. Although here I guess there is a small side note. Some researchers don't actually think Mars had liquid water, or at least not everything we see was a result of liquid water. Because based on mineral research, some scientists also think that maybe, instead of liquid water, a lot of this was also the result of liquid CO2. Because the early Martian conditions could have actually allowed liquid CO2 to exist, and we obviously know CO2 seems to be still everywhere on Mars. And so in at least one experiment, scientists actually showed that liquid CO2 can generally produce very similar chemical reactions to what we actually see on Mars, especially when it's mixed with liquid water and a few other chemical elements. For example, potassium chloride and manganese chloride seem to actually produce almost identical results to Martian meteorites. And since the early Mars conditions might have actually been perfect for liquid CO2 and not for liquid water, at least one study presents us with counter evidence that liquid water is not even needed. A lot of Martian geology and chemistry can be explained if this was a mixture between liquid CO2, liquid water, and a few other salts. And this particular explanation right now does actually have certain benefits, mostly because trying to explain a very large ocean of water is still a little bit challenging. And so when it comes to understanding what early Mars was like, there are still quite a lot of unanswered questions. Questions that could be best answered if we of course went there or at least collected a bunch of samples and then brought them back to Earth. But right now, based on the presence of carbonates, phyllosilicates, and sulfates, this research seemed to point at a much more diverse liquid environment and not just liquid water. But we also had some research in regards to certain phenomena on Mars that are both surprising and can also be potentially dangerous for future astronauts. And both of them are somewhat unexpected. First one is in regards to the famous dust devils. This by now has become a very well-known phenomenon on Mars, because Mars seems to have so many dust devils everywhere. And in the last video, we even talked about a lot of marks that they seem to leave everywhere that are even visible from space. And so these tiny Martian whirlwinds, though not being as powerful as on Earth, seem to pose their own danger that nobody expected. And this was recently discovered by listening to the sounds they produce, especially as they actually passed one of the rovers back in 2021. And so here, by listening to these events, researchers discovered unusual cracks. Cracks that seem to happen every single time and that now have been explained as basically electric discharges. And so because Mars is so dry and because all of this is basically dust, this fast moving dust becomes so electrified that it starts to produce its own lightning. With all of this actually happening really frequently. Several cracks were heard in just a few milliseconds and so this phenomenon can potentially create a lot of static electricity. And this was then recreated in the lab as well. So basically scientists were able to recreate this, including the production of very similar sounds. And well, this is technically a new risk. It can be a risk for rovers, but it can also be a risk for astronauts or any habitat in the location where these dust devils seem to be pretty common. Here you essentially have this dust tornado moving relatively fast, that though doesn't actually produce enough pressure, produces huge amounts of electricity, that in theory can zap everything multiple times per second and potentially cause a lot of damage and injury. And so definitely quite an unusual discovery. And then we have the discovery in regards to Mars quakes. And a lot of this once again comes from the InSight mission that was able to collect a lot of data over the years. And here what the researchers discovered is that for some reason there are thousands of unusual quakes on Mars only happen during summertime. And they seem to be clustered in certain locations and seem to be also different from everything else. They always seem to have the same intensity and only happen in the Martian summer. 
and moreover, they only seem to be in the north of Mars, not in the south. And here we're talking about quakes happening up to 10 times per day, making the surface shake basically every few hours. Naturally, for any habitat, this might be a little bit problematic. But in terms of science, right now this really has no explanation. Now, because this seems to be seasonal, on Earth we can maybe find some examples that are kind of similar, but they usually involve water. For example, during periods of increased rainfall, when the rock composition changes because it's wet, we do get occasional seasonal earthquakes. But on Mars, this doesn't really make as much sense because we don't really have rain here, and so unless this is something underground that we don't detect, wet rock here would not make sense. And so one potential explanation is that this is somehow related to the carbon dioxide ice that grows and retreats annually and could maybe cause some kind of an effect. Now previously it has been associated with avalanches in certain locations on Mars, but in terms of the actual location there is really no match. One of these Mars quakes is very very far from a typical location for an avalanche. And so quite a bizarre and unexplainable mystery. But when it comes to these Mars quakes, there's actually a recent discovery that does explain to us that not all Mars quakes seem to come from within. Because a separate study discovered that many of these Mars quakes we usually think come from inside are actually the result of various craters. Or basically at least a handful of Mars quakes has now been associated with some kind of an impact that produced a crater a few meters across. Now because Mars doesn't have a very thick atmosphere, every single collision does produce a relatively powerful Mars quake. Once again, another problem for a potential astronaut mission. And so at least 50 of these events so far have been correlated with Martian impacts. But that would still not explain why they seem to happen more often in the summer and more often in the north. And so here, even though some impacts could maybe explain a few of these, they could not explain a thousand that's been observed so far. Which means that we still have some mysteries to cover in the future and some questions to answer about the red planet. But if you'd like to learn about some of the previous mysteries and some of the previous resolutions, check out more videos in the description. And so on that note, once we have something else from Mars, we'll come back and talk more about this in the next video, possibly in the next few months. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.